started, and uh, so far, the conference call thing is working tonight. We have one person on with us, uh, listening to us live through this little Bluetooth microphone that I've got on my lapel. And uh, so, everyone can say hi to Brother Lee. Hi, Brother Lee. All right, so, hello, Brother Lee. And I don't know, some others might join on. At that point, I won't know. Uh, I get a report later on telling me uh, how many people called in and so forth. Uh, we had one person call in this morning, and they were on for 45 minutes just listening to the hold music. They're the only ones that got through. Everyone else got busy signals. So we'll see how it goes, but for now, we'll do with what we've got. Amen? Amen. All right, well, go ahead and take your song books, and while you do that, I'm going to bump the heat down a little bit because I'm going to roast like a chicken up here or a turkey or whatever the case may be. Uh, but take your song books and turn to number 30 on your, in your song books. Nothing but the blood. Okay, that's number 30. What can wash away my sin? Well, the answer is easy. Nothing but the blood. That's right. And so let's go ahead and sing that out together. Hey, everyone, as best you can, number 30. gather together. I do pray that you would help us as we uh, look at your word tonight. Give us some... Uh, Father, I just pray to you bless with all that is said and done. Uh, may you certainly be honored and glorified in our midst. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go ahead and be seated and turn all the way back to 245 in your songbooks. 245. And we'll sing the old account was settled. That's number 245. And go ahead and sing that out with me, please. Two, four, five. Yeah. 
settled. I mean, it's a clean slate. Amen. And not only that is, not only is it a clean slate that I was given when I got saved at the age of 10, uh, he promised he wasn't going to add any more to this slate. Amen. He's kept it white as snow. He's washed it clearly. And uh, that's a wonderful thing. All right. Well, as far as announcements go, I'll remind you again that the ladies meeting on April 4th at Emmanuel Bible has been canceled. They'll not be having that at all this year. The revival meeting to be out here from April 5th to April 10th has been postponed and we'll be having that revival meeting October 18 through the 24th. And I get it? Wow, this is doing great up here. So, uh, so we are still having revival, but it's going to be in October. However, I do think that it's our responsibility that we should uh, still send Brother Foot a love offering, even though he's not going to be here with us. And understand he has a lot of meetings that's been canceled. And uh, if we can help at least in a little way, that would be a good thing. And uh, certainly want to do that. Uh, so then. Uh, the the mother-daughter banquet, as far as we know, is still going to be taking place, and we'll let you know as we get closer to that date if anything's changed with that. Uh, as I've also mentioned, go ahead and be, continue praying, rather, for Kenny Baldwin, pastor down there in uh, Virginia. Uh, but uh, as of Saturday, March 28 at 5.30 p.m., Pastor Kenny, ha Kenny has been released from the hospital and is now recovering at home. Uh, we are so grateful for the prayers of so many people around the world. Please continue to pray. He gets much needed rest and quickly regains his strength. God is so good. And so this is one of many reports that we're getting regarding people who have uh, contracted the coronavirus but recovered. And, uh, and so we're certainly glad for that. That does not, again, take away from the seriousness of the situation. And we ought to take all precautions that we can. Uh, between services this evening, my family and I came to church, uh, well, around our normal time, I guess. Yes, it was, uh, but disinfected the church, wiped everything down, wiped all the touchable handles, lysoled all the seats, even came by. Uh, Brother uh, Goss uh, came in early, and he was sitting in the back pew, and I told him to open wide his mouth, and he did, but I did not spray. I did not spray, so he's going to be fine. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, disinfected the church and so forth, and uh, of course, we. Uh, anyways, we're not going to any further with that, but do take the necessary precautions in your hand, uh, take the necessary precautions. And again, those of you that uh, if you are a high risk category, we do ask that you stay home. And if you have any kind of symptoms, we also ask that you stay home and use one of the means that we have, whether it be online or trying this new thing with the conference call. And hopefully that'll, that'll work and uh, give more people an option to be able to uh, listen in live. There's a few more things in the works and uh, we'll see if we can get this thing going. Nonetheless, it is now time, I think I've accomplished getting through all the announcements without too much of uh, uh, bloopers. And so go ahead and take your songbooks, please, and turn to 109, Savior, Like a Shepherd, Lead Us. That's 109 in your songbooks. And uh, I'm going to sing that out, please. Savior, Like a Shepherd, Lead Us, 109. Bless Jesus, bless 
either by mailing it in to the Old Fashioned Baptist Church, 12260 Ferguson Valley Road, Lewistown, PA, or going online to paypal.me forward slash the OFBC, T-H-E-O-F-B-C, and you can make a donation there if you would like. Uh, for the offering, if Brother Gus, if you would mind praying and asking God's blessing, that would be wonderful. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to be in your house. Amen. Amen. We thank you for this time that we can give back to you the portion that you have richly given on to us and that we can share our blessings to you. Amen. We thank you for your love for us. Just continue to be with the church as we grow and go forth, Lord, that we would see more people come in and be a blessing to us. And Lord, we thank you for what you will do in our precious name. Amen. Amen. Chapter 4, and uh, last week we uh, preached, oh I don't remember what the title of it was, uh, what is your mindset, what is your mindset from the same passage, now I chose not to put it online, uh, I can't really go into much details of why, I just, I just didn't, uh, but this one I believe will be going up, uh, but uh, we're going to be preaching from the same passage, or at least a portion of it, and uh, I want to talk to you about the ministry of Christ tonight, and uh, the ministry of Christ, and uh, what we can learn from it. And basically, we're going to pick it up in Luke chapter 4. Uh, we'll pick it up at verse 16, and we'll read down through verse 19. So just those four verses. Uh, go ahead and stand with me, please, for the reading of God's Word, as is our custom. And uh, since uh, we're looking at, well, we'll go ahead and read these responsibly. I'll begin in verse 16, your on 17, and so forth. Uh, the Bible says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. 
As his custom and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And when was and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Father, I pray that you bless now the preaching of your word tonight. Uh, Father, help us to see... Uh, well, what I think is really obvious regarding Christ's ministry on this earth, but Father, I pray that you just bring it down to the bottom shelf for all of us, and, and uh, Lord, that we might learn something here tonight and uh, make appropriate applications to our own lives. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So go and be seated. So last week we did talk a little bit about uh, this passage of Isaiah that Jesus was reading from in Isaiah 61. And I pointed out that he did not read the entire passage or even read the entire uh, sentence. Uh, he only read partway through. The sentence wasn't even done and he stopped. He sat down and everybody was looking at him. Uh, and they were, you know, kind of, you know, just wondering what he was going to say. And he said to them, uh, this day, verse 21, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And, and those that bear him witness, the Bible says, wondered at his gracious words. And uh, but then they started thinking amongst themselves, well, isn't this Joseph's son? I mean, who is he to say this about himself? And of course... He speaks to them and talks about the proverb that they're using uh, about uh, physician heal thyself. And he used another proverb back to them talking about the fact that no prophet is accepted uh, in his own country. Uh, and then he gave them the illustration of uh, the Canaanite woman that uh, was a widow. And, uh, or let me see here. Uh, during the days of uh, uh, Elijah, uh, when the heavens were shut up, this is verse 25, uh, three years and six months, when a great famine was throughout the land, but, but unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And so this Canaanite widow, there's a, a bunch of Israelite Hebrew widows that could have used help, but God didn't send Elijah to any of those people. God sent Elijah to a Canaanite widow. And then we read a little bit further. He gives the illustration of Elijah. I'm sorry, I got that backwards. Elijah was sent to the Canaanite woman, and now we have Elisha. Uh, but other words, Nonetheless, Elisha, uh, there was a lot of lepers in Israel, but God didn't send Elisha to the Israelite or the Hebrew lepers. Rather, God sent him to or sent to him a, a, uh, um, a Syrian leper. And this really upset them so much so that they wanted to throw him down a hill. And you know the story, he, he got away. And we, and we talked about this mindset. There's the mindset that these people had there uh, in his hometown, Nazareth, compared to the mindset of the people of Capernaum uh, who listened to him and heard what he had to say and it was part of uh, what he was teaching and preaching, at least at this particular juncture in Capernaum's history. Uh, and so we talked about all that, but I want us to, to go back again and, and look at some things that Jesus said. And, and one of the things, let me say this, that we mentioned regarding the prophecy and why he only read part of the prophecy and not all the prophecy is because one of the things that we have to understand when we try to understand prophecy is that sometimes the prophetic passage or prophecy will be fulfilled in stages, not all at one time. And, and uh, this is one reason why some, some we get our eschatology all mixed up sometimes, or end time doctrine mixed up, because we, we misfocus on that. And that's what happened with the Jews. They, they misfocus on the, the eschatology or the, the prophecy regarding the Messiah. They just believed that when the Messiah came, he was going to be a conquering king and set everything just in order. Uh, they didn't see it as being for, uh, fulfilled in stages. And so Jesus came to fulfill the first part of that prophecy, but the last part of that prophecy won't be fulfilled until the millennial kingdom and whatnot. But anyways, here we find Jesus, and he sits down and reads from the scriptures from the book of Isaiah, and he speaks of the ministry that Isaiah spoke of, and, uh, and we see that he made a distinction here. There's, there's three things I want to share with you tonight. Not sure how this is all going to go, but hopefully uh, it'll be exactly what we need to hear. But as we look at the ministry of Christ, there's three things that we see regarding his ministry. And the first one is this. We see there's a great distinction. 
There's a great distinction with his ministry and where Jesus was exalted. Uh, the Bible tells us as we go a little bit further back in Luke chapter 4, after Jesus was finished on the Mount of Temptations, uh, the Bible says in verse 14, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. Uh, and the Bible tells us that there was a great fame uh, that went out through all the region round about. Uh, prior to that, we see that Jesus uh, was baptized. And I'll not go into a tangent on that. We spent time already talking about why Jesus was baptized. And nine times out of ten, it's probably not the reason why you were told uh, growing up in Sunday school. But anyways, uh, Jesus was baptized. The Bible says uh, that when he was baptized, the heavens opened and the Spirit of God descended upon him bodily. But the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. And of course, we hear the words of God about this being my beloved Son and so on and so forth. But the Spirit of God came upon him. And then in chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit spirit into the wilderness. And we spent some time talking about his going into the wilderness to face the devil was something that, G that the Holy Spirit of God led him to do. And the purpose, as Matthew tells us, was to be tempted. And, uh, and so he went through that temptation. He comes back from that temptation. He returns to the power of the Spirit. And now he's in Nazareth, his hometown, where people aren't going to listen to what he has to say. And he, and he sits down and he, and he stands up, rather, and reads from the book of Isaiah. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. You see, there's a great distinction here regarding Jesus and his ministry. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. And this is this, this thing that distinguished the Lord from everybody else. And even those people in Nazareth, they couldn't argue the profoundness of his words. They could not argue with the fact that he spake as one having authority. When he was a Capernaum, they spoke of him as one that speaks with authority. Not like the scribes and the Pharisees who basically just repeated a bunch of words and it wasn't anything real to them. No, he spake as one having authority. And there was something different about the ministry of Jesus Christ in comparison to all the contemporaries of his day. There was something about Jesus that set him apart. Now, gr truthfully, we could argue, well, he was God in the flesh, and that's what set him apart. But I remind you again that Jesus was God, yes, but he was also man. And I believe much of what Jesus did in his earthly ministry, he did as a man who was led of or filled with or empowered by the Spirit. And one reason why I believe this is Jesus very clearly told his disciples, when I leave, he says, great Greater works shall ye do than these. And uh, he told them that you think that what I've done is great? He said, when I've gone and I've left, you're going to do even greater works than I do. How's that, Jesus? Well, because the Holy Ghost is going to come and he's going to indwell you. And because of that comforter that's going to come, that's going to replace me in your life, or it's going to take place of me being here, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, is going to be inside of you. And because of that, you're going to do greater works than even I myself, the Son of God, did. How is that so? Well, I believe again that Jesus' ministry and what he did on this earth in, in large respects, don't get me wrong, I'm not taking away the deity of Christ or taking away that I'm sure there's things he did as God. But we also see that he did a lot as a man who could be led of the Spirit just like you and I. And so what set him apart? Was it his deity? Sure, I suppose. But from a human perspective, I believe the thing that set him apart was the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. Now I won't spend a whole lot of time, a whole lot of time talking about the anointing side of this. Um, we've spoke about this uh, this concept in August of 2019 on on anointing. Did a whole series on anointing, and we we touched on this passage not not in great detail, but we touched on it. But it does go without saying tonight that we need an anointing. It does go without saying tonight that we need to have the power of God upon our lives. Uh, we need the Spirit of God to be upon us. And in Isaiah 61, which is what he's uh, quoting from, um, or we can even see right here in Luke 18, the Bible says. 
says the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. Now he anointed him to do something, but the reason the Spirit of the Lord God was upon him is because he was anointed. And certainly we can see why we need to be anointed. Uh, but I'll not spend much time there. Uh, but we see that he was anointed to preach good tidings. If you, in fact, let's do this. Go ahead and turn to Isaiah 61 with me. Isaiah 61. I'm turning there as well. Now, not necessarily read the verses, I suppose, but I'm going to point to you some things that it says that he was going to do. Um, well, let's just read it. Verse 1, the Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's where Jesus stopped in his uh, reading. And the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to point unto them that mourn in Zion, to, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old ways, and they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And it goes on and, and so forth. But we find here, as far as Isaiah is concerned in his preaching, and what it prophesied about Jesus, the reason why he was anointed was to preach good tidings, to bind up the brokenhearted, and that means to repair and to put back together, to bind Bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty, to open prisons, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, to proclaim the day of vengeance, to comfort all that mourn, to give beauty for ashes, to give joy for mourning, to clothe them with praise, or to clothe with praise those that have spirit of heaviness. And uh, he did all these things so that, or these things were prophesied to be done, so that they, the people who received this, might be called trees of righteousness, and God might be glorified and what we see here is a renewing and a reviving that will be done praise God but here we understand that Jesus whole ministry was based on this truth the spirit of the Lord is upon me the spirit of the Lord is upon me you see this is what separates one ministry from another and I'm not necessarily talking about churches uh, I might just be talking about individuals. You see, we all have ministry. We all have a purpose. We all have a service that we're supposed to do. And one thing that will set your ministry apart from another ministry is this truth right here. Is the Spirit of the Lord upon you? You see, this is what separates one ministry from another. It's not the crowds. You know, a lot of crowds are drawn to false teachings. You don't have to look very far to know this is true. You can see some of the mega churches around here and the false teachings that go along with it. You know, a lot of the TV evangelists and so forth. The crowds, crowds don't mean a thing. That's not what sets us apart. It's not the programs. Certainly we could have a program here once the uh, coronavirus thing is out of the way. And, and we could have a program and have a pack of pew Sunday. But then what? What good does it do if we pack a pew? What good does it do if we fill the auditorium if the Spirit of God is not involved in the situation? You see, even the labor that we might put forth, you say, well, one reason why one ministry is different than another ministry is because of the hard work that they put in. And I agree, we ought to work hard and we ought to labor for the Lord, but the labor is not what sets us apart from one another. No, it's whether or not the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. You see, the difference between ministries, the distinction, the uh, great uh, uh, distinction between ministries, between the Lord and those of His counterpart of those days, the religious leaders of those days, the difference is the Spirit of the Lord. If you take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 127, some of you might even know exactly where I'm going with this, but this is a, a song of degrees for Solomon. And... Um, in Psalm 127, in verse 1, it says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor. They labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh 
but in vain. He might as well just gone ahead and kept his nap. Except uh, he says it is vain for you to rise up early. Amen. All of you, uh, all of you uh, uh, early birds out there, you know, those of you, brother, brother Goss and brother Spiker, like to get up and you know before the sun rises, like to get up at five in the morning, four in the morning, or whatever time it is you get up at some ungodly hour. Uh, the Bible says it is vain for you to rise up early. Of course, the Bible also says it's vain for you to sit up late. <laughs> so we have a night owl over here that said, Amen, that's right. It's vain for you to rise up early. Well, it's also vain for you to sit up late. Uh, but anyways, it's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. The point that's being made here is God is saying uh, uh, in this psalm, uh, he's saying that except the Lord build a house, you can work all day long. You can work as hard as you can. But if God's not in it, you're laboring in vain. Your work is in vain. You're, you're, you're just putting together a bunch of sweat and so forth. But nothing's going to be accomplished of it. At least nothing that's worthwhile. He said, unless the, the Lord keep the city, unless the Lord protect the city, you can have the watchman on the tower. He can see the enemy coming. He can blow the trumpet. But it's not going to do you a hell of beans if God is not protecting that city. And he says, those of you that rise up early because you got to get it done, or those of you that stay up late because you got to get it done, or, or you rise up early because you can't sleep with your sorrow, or you stay up late because you're fretting, or whatever the case may be, whatever your reasoning is, it's all vain if God is not in it. If God's not in it, what's the point? The Bible says in Psalm 33, turn back a few pages, you can find that there, Psalm 33, I'm going to get a drink of water. The Bible says in Psalm 33 and verse 16, There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. And of course, we put this in perspective of those days and how the armies and military worked and so forth. You know, a large army, uh, and even today a large army, you know, is a good thing as far as protection goes. But here you have this king, and he's surrounded by a multitude of hosts. But the Bible says there is no king saved by the multitude of hosts. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. Doesn't matter how strong you are, a mighty man is not delivered by much strength. The Bible says in verse 17, and horse is a vain thing for safety. Now, today we might not see much point in that, uh, but basically a horse in those days, I mean, that was top-notch uh, technology when it comes to military and, and warfare and so forth. Being able to get on a horse and, and uh, you can outdo the footmen and so forth, I mean, that was, that, was, uh, that was something to have in your military. But he says a horse is a vain thing for safety, neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, he says in verse 18, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, upon them that hope in His mercy. Again, we see the concept that if God's not in it, it's not worth being done. You know, uh, Jesus said, the, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And so here we find that a horse is a vain thing for safety and, and all this, but behold, the eyes of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, upon them that hope in His mercy. In Proverbs chapter 16, if you turn there please, Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 8. Now, many times as you read the book of Proverbs, each verse stands alone on its own. It's a book of Proverbs. I believe verses 8 and 9 do stand alone, but I'm going to use them both together as you see in a moment. But verse 8, the Bible says, Better is a little with righteousness than great revenue without. Right. He says, You're better off having very little and having righteousness than you are at having a great revenue and not having right. It's better to have nothing and be with God than to have a whole lot and not be with God. You understand? It's better to not have any talent and have God on your side than to have all the talent of the world and not have God on your side. In verse 9, he says, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. You can plan all you want, but you need God. I need God. And see, again, what set Jesus' ministry apart from the religious leaders of his day is the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. You're in Proverbs. Look at chapter 21 with me, please. 
Proverbs chapter 21. In verse 30, the Bible says, There is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. The horse, again, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. You can plan, you can have all the wisdom and all the counsel of this world, you can have all the great thinkers get together, you can have all the programs and all the uh, ways of trying to figure things out. Boy, if our building was here, if our building looked like this, or we did that, or we did the other thing, and, and all that, I'm, I'm glad that we're trying out this technology to get the word out more, uh, but none of that matters if God's not in it. If the Spirit of the Lord is not involved, it's pain, vain, and vain again. He says, there's no wisdom nor understanding or counsel against the Lord. You can try all you want to go against God. There's nothing, nothing that can go against the Lord. And he says, the horse is prepared against the day of battle. That's all fine and good, but safety, safety is of the Lord. If you take your Bibles then and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 4, Paul's dealing with the church of Corinth, and they had some schisms going on in that church. Paul's going to make a claim here in a moment, and he's going to tell them that they're being carnal. And I think we've taught on this, I'm not sure, I feel like we have, but carnality we often think of as being wickedness and fleshly and so forth. And I understand where we get the fleshly idea of it, carnal, being dealing with the flesh and all that. But a lot of times we have a misunderstanding, I think, of what carnality is. There's a lot of carnal Christians, and it's not because they're living in some wicked sin. It's because they're carnally minded. They're, they're, they're fleshly minded. They, they think in temporal terms as opposed to eternal terms. But here we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 4, the Bible says, For while one saith, I am of Paul... And another, I am of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? Isn't that a carnal mindset? He goes on to say, Who then is Paul? Or who is Apollos? But ministers by whom he believed. In other words, they're just servants. They're just ministers that preach the gospel. And through their preaching, you came to know Christ as your Savior. But that doesn't mean you're supposed to be a follower of Apollos or a follower of Paul. Or one person is better than the other because, well, I was led to the Lord by the Apostle Paul. Yeah, well, I was led to the Lord by a great orator by the name of Apollos. Big deal, he says. You're carnal when you have that mindset. In verse 6, he says, I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. I might have gone along and planted the seed. Apollos might have come behind me and, and cultivated that seed. And, uh, but at the end of the day, it's God that gave the interest. I could go out there in that field and plow and someone else would come behind me and drop in the seed. Someone else would come behind them and pour the water on. But when it comes down to it, the only way that seed's going to pop up out of the ground is if God does it. God's got to do it. And so Jesus said, as he's speaking there in Luke and in the synagogue, and he reads the scriptures, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he says, that's the distinction of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. And church, I would highly encourage you to make sure that the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. Now please understand, if you're saved, you're indwelled by the Spirit. I think an analogy that we can use here, even when it says here in verse 1 of our text, but Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to have a Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to have the Holy Spirit directing our steps. We need to have the Holy Spirit empowering us on what we do. If we're going to do anything, then the Spirit of the Lord has to be upon us. The last two points are very simple and very quick. My wife says, uh-huh, you know. But we see the great distinction, and of course we see the great message. The Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord, or back in Luke chapter 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me, here it is, to preach the gospel to the poor. 
And I believe the reason why he mentioned the poor is because he's just trying to, trying to give the expression that, uh, you know, especially in these days, you understand, many times the poor, uh, more so than today, was looked on as the outcasts or those that the dregs of society kind of concept. And, and Jesus said, this gospel that I'm preaching is for everybody. And so he singles out the poor. And of course, this is also what's uh, spoken of in Isaiah. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact of what Isaiah was dealing with uh, in his day and whatnot. Uh, uh, but anyways, nonetheless, the message is, this great message our Lord has, is to preach the gospel to the poor. You understand, uh, again, as far as a church body goes, as far as a, a fellowship of believers, as far as you and I as individual Christians, uh, we're not going to accomplish anything in this world if our goal and our target isn't for the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our purpose for even being left on this world. That we might preach the gospel to every creature. And certainly the message of preaching the gospel ought to be forefront in our, in our ideas and our mindset. The, the monies that we spend as a ministry, uh, one of the main focuses ought to be the fact of getting the gospel of Jesus Christ out to the lost and dying world. And certainly we have a responsibility before God that we might preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it's a great message. I mean, I say to you that we as a, as a church, when I say we as a church, I mean believers all around the world has a responsibility to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ that the church might be enlarged. But let me remind you, it is Christ that will add to the church and not me and not you and not anyone else. Not a program, not a plan, but Jesus Christ. And so we see the great message. We also see, you see that, that point was short. We also see a great work. Here he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And so here we find a great work as well. He went to the people that were needing in other words, he, he didn't necessarily, uh, he spoke to uh, wealthy, he spoke to uh, people who were affluent, he spoke with people that, were, uh, that, that, that had it all together and so forth. He didn't turn them away, but we find them almost every time you see a critic talking about him, where was he at? He was eating with what? Publicans and sinners. Now, there are some that take that concept and twist the scriptures and twist the context to, you know, I can hang out at a local bar if I want to. No, that's not what he's doing. And number one, you have to realize that what publicans and sinners are, when we're talking about a Jewish custom, a sinner was somebody who no longer went to the synagogue and no longer practiced the Jewish customs. Okay, and so that's what they meant by sinner. And a publican was a Jew who basically was working for the Roman government, such as the tax collectors and so forth. And so they were looked down upon by the religious Jew of that day because they were not following the practice of, of, of Judaism, which was wrong for them to do. They were still under the law at this point. And and they were buddying up and uh, making money off of their, the, off the other Jews at the, at the behest of the Roman Empire. And certainly that was something that caused them to be looked down upon. And certainly would be something that meant that they were breaking very key components of the, uh, the, uh, the Mosaic Covenant and whatnot. Uh, but it doesn't mean when he was sitting with publicans and sinners that he was down at the local watering hole having a, having a scotch or having a, uh, some sort of a beer or something along that line. Uh, but what it meant was he went to the people that needed to be reached and were willing to be reached. There's a lot of broken hearted people. There's a lot of people that were hurting. A lot of people that were considered outcasts and destitute and the religious crowd of that day didn't have time for them. They can't do anything for our synagogue so we're not going to do anything for them kind of concept. And Jesus said, those are the exact people I want to go to. You see, he had a great work. He had a great message. But again, this great message and this great work if you take the equation, the fact that he's God in the flesh out of it, just look at it from the human perspective, this great message and this great work would not have been accomplished had it not been for that great distinction. And that is the fact that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. I don't know what God has called you to do as an individual. I don't know what God has purpose in your heart to do. I don't know what God's plan for your life beyond now. And some of you, I realize I'm talking during their 80s or 60s or whatever and so forth. And you might think, well, my life, you know, I'm just, I'm just hanging on until it's over. Well, let me say this to you. Whatever time you have left, God still has a plan for that time. 
Whether I'm talking to the, the senior citizen of the Old Fashioned Baptist Church or some senior saint watching on YouTube later on or whether I'm talking to a young teenager or someone just getting ready to graduate high school or someone who's off in college or someone who's entering their career. Whatever the case may be, God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for your life. But the key component of all of that was the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. Is the Spirit of the Lord upon you tonight? How's your personal ministry going? Father, we love you and thank you for your goodness. I ask that you bless this invitation time. Uh, may you be honored and glorified in our midst. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If God spoke to your heart, go ahead and stand. The pianist is playing. The altar is open for you. And uh, do whatever God has told you to do.